entered and sat down, so um, we're going to get going. <laughs> Guys at the back, can you hear me okay? No. Come on. No? no? All right, what if I speak like this? Really? That loud? Still can't hear me? Higher? Okay. Let's move the, let's move the microphone. Now. So, if I speak like this, can you hear me okay? Yes, just about, huh? All right, well, I'll try and uh, remember to speak loud. If I uh, stray into my old habits of speaking lower, just, you know, tell me, to, tell me to raise the sound, the volume. I don't know where to put this so that we don't get the feedback. Um, welcome to Hacking from the Palm of Your Hand. As you can tell from the title, this is all about palms. <laughs> Too many mics. Um, my name is Paul Clip. I'm a consultant at Adstick. Uh, I've been there for about a year. Before that, I used to work in a system integration firm, both, both building online systems and then securing them. So this presentation is part, hey, here are some of the cool things that are already there for the Palm platform related to hacking, and also part tool release, and a little bit of ideas about the future, about you know, how the tool could be enhanced. So before we start, let's do a quick poll. How many people have PDAs in the audience? Wow. OK. Uh, how many people have Palm Pilots or Palm or Palm OS-based PDAs? I will not move close <laughs> to the desk and try not to fall off backstage either. Um, of those Palm-based uh, devices, how many of them have wireless or network capability? You know, 802.11. Wow. OK. Quite a few. Cool. So we'll get started. Um, this is the agenda. Quick talk about goals, and I'm going to really talk about past, present, and future. Past meaning, so, thank you. Past meaning some of the tools that have been developed recently or not so recently um, that basically have to do with uh, with hacking and security. Um, present is all about Austin. Austin is a vulnerability scanner that we'll be talking about to some detail, in some detail about how it was built, some of the design criteria, what it can do. We'll show some demos. And then future, just ideas on where to go with it. OK? So quick goals. Obviously, a review of Palm as a hacking platform. Um, we'll walk through you know, what, it, what it takes to build a Palm-based um, vulnerability scanner, you know, or at least one way to do it, right? because there are lots of different ways. I'll move back again. Um, obviously, one of the goals is to release a tool to, to the public. And finally, the obligatory have fun. So let's start with the past. All right. Oh, we have a trivia question. Who knows what, this, what the first Palm Pilot was called? 1,000, yes. And how much, how much memory did it have? 128K? Well, I've yeah, I five twelve is five twelve is what I've seen, but I think one twenty eight was was before that. So, yeah, long time ago. Who had a Pilot one thousand? Wow, some diehards. Who still has a Pilot one thousand? <laughs> All right, two people here. <laughs> um, so let's keep going. So, the Palm platform has really been in transition. I think a lot of people know this. So I'm not going to spend much time. You've got the old and the new, right? The old is all based on the 68,000 core processors. To, they call it the Dragon Ball processor. It's basically the 68,000 plus a bunch of um, additional circuits uh, to um, basically give you a, uh, a small, make it possible for you to build a small form factor computer. Um, you can see the speeds, etc. Sometimes you get color screens, sometimes you don't. Uh, most of them, or all of them, will have either serial or USB and infrared. and uh, Really, you're looking at Palm OS 4 and below. 4 was really the transitional OS. Palm basically said, if, if your app runs on 4, we'll make sure it runs on 5. 5 and beyond, 6 will be, I think, released this year, or is in the works at least, if not this year, early next year, all running on ARM processor. So I don't know what the, what the max speed is. These things go very high, as far as I can see from some of the, uh, the iPacks that use them as well. So this is a RISC processor, uh, obviously a lot faster. You basically get more RAM, better screens, color, USB, IR, expansion slots. Some of the older palms had them too, compact flash, SDIO. 
for this presentation, we're going to be focusing on the old stuff. Two reasons for that. One, there's tons of old stuff out there, way more than any Palm OS 5 um, uh, pilots or, or Palm devices. And the other reason is I don't have an OS 5 Palm device, and so I kind of developed it on the platform I have. Um, why don't we talk a little bit about security tools? And what I'm going to do here is welcome our friend, a developer's friend, an excellent tool called the Palm Open Source Emulator. This is basically, actually, how many people know about this? OK, so maybe about 20%. This is a, uh, um, an emulator for uh, the 68,000-based um, Palm OSs. You basically, it's the shell. It's the hardware. It emulates the hardware. You download ROMs. You can get them from Palm for free. You can sign up as a developer. You can get them from Handspring as well. You basically download the emulator, download the ROMs, put the two together, and you have a Palm development environment. It's way faster developing on this than having to download stuff to your Palm, try it out, and then you know make changes. You can have skins for it. So this is actually the skin for the, the Treo 300, which is the device I have. Um, it is the third generation Treo. I, I like it a lot, except from a manufacturing perspective, it's not as reliable as you'd want it to be. Uh, the nice thing about it is that on this Treo is on Sprint, which has a 1x RTT, 3G, net, 3G network, which means that you get pretty good bandwidth. I can use it as a modem, maybe get 80k a second. So that's not bad from a cell phone. Um, let's go back to security tools. Password generators, there are a bunch of password generators out there. Two I find kind of fun. One is called PassGen. I'm not going to show you all these tools, but they're kind of fun. If you click on default, it'll basically, you know, you give it valid characters and give it different options. You can generate, it'll generate you passwords. If ever you want to have a password, you can type with your left hand only. You click left, and it only uses the characters from the left hand side of the keyboard or the right hand side of the keyboard. So if you need, you know, if you're looking for that really hard to, hard to crack password, this is kind of interesting. The other one, passphrase, basically comes up with random words that you can start to string together to, to build a passphrase. Um, if you're looking for encryption, right now, you know, the Palm OS, especially 4 and 3, and I'm guessing 5 as well, is basically, you know, it's not really DMCA friendly. Uh, there's no memory protection, whatever. There's a copy bit that is easy to flip. Well, we'll show you, we'll show that very briefly. Uh, if you want to encrypt something, CryptoPad is a replacement from the MemoPad. It's a very, very good program. It's up on SourceForge, which tells you that it's free. Most of these programs are either free or shareware. Uh, Secret is another place that will, another basically encrypted memo pad. The nice thing about it is that it has a, a conduit, so you can update your secrets on the PC, on the Mac, and then download, download them to your pilot. <laughs> there are a bunch of password crackers that have been written by uh, some of the ad state guys. Uh, one was to crack the, uh, the Cisco passwords. Another one is a tool called NotSync, which is kind of funny because there's, there's actually a, a development environment, I think, called NotSync now. And basically what NotSync does, not a very nice tool, but you really have to work at it to, to get somebody's password with it. What you have to do is you start NotSync, and then you say to someone, hey, Bob, would you mind uh, starting an infrared hot sync and just point it at my pilot? And if Bob does that, then the first thing that gets sent over is the, uh, the lock password, the password that you can set to basically secure some of your records on the palm. And up to... Palm OS 4, it was easily crackable. So if you're, if you're in need of fun, you can do this. I did this. Uh, I, you know, I forewarned the gentleman, and I told him, hey, let's try it out, right, the security guy. And we got his password, and his comment was, ah, oh, crap, I guess I need to change my Windows password as well now. So <laughs> don't, don't use the same passwords. Not a good idea. Um, plus, I mean, he must have been like, if, if they're like my Windows passwords, they're long, right? You say, like, oh, crap. I have to time my password every time I want to see a record or look up a phone number. Um, and another thing, War Dialer, TBA, uh, that's actually pretty neat. It was written by a gentleman called Kingpin who used to work at AdStake, uh, very, very well versed in the uh, in area of handheld devices. And so this is actually a complete War Dialer. You can basically you know, configure it. You can give it prefixes, masks, and start time, end times, all sorts of stuff. So I haven't tried it with my Treo. But theoretically, it should actually work. So this is actually maybe a really small war dining platform. All right, enough about security tools. 
communication tools. I'm not going to go through all of these. Um, Telnet. Telnet useful not just for telnetting to hosts, but also via serial port. If ever you happen to be in a, uh, um, a hosting facility and you have a serial cable with you and you plug it in, you plug it one end into your palm, the other end into a, let's say, Cisco device, you can maybe access console that way. Uh, SSH is available. Freeware only v1, which is kind of sad. I believe there is a commercial version by F-Secure that does v2. Uh, Web and Mail, again, this is all free. Uh, Eudora has a very nice suite. We'll see Eudora Web briefly in action. They're all free. The nice thing about Eudora Web is when you're, a lot of the browsers on the Palm basically go through a proxy, right? And the proxy reformats the, the, the content and everything. Eudora Web is a text-only browser, and it goes directly. It has, uses no proxy. It goes right to the source. So you see exactly what kind of HTML comes back. And when you're doing tests and things, that's, that's pretty useful. Um, Magic Ping is actually pretty cool. It's a um, ping utility that has a ton of options. You can specify retries, timeouts, the contents of the ping packages, whether you want to flood ping, which I'm not quite sure on a device with this amount of bandwidth what flood ping really means, but um, <laughs> you can. You can try. Uh, FTP exists also. There's a bunch of infrared tools as well. Uh, from like an infrared monitor, if you believe that you know, some evil agency is trying to monitor, yeah, unfortunately, as you can tell, this digital or virtual uh, palm doesn't really have an IR port. But basically what it will do is it will tell you how much IR is coming in and like, showing you. So if you believe someone's trying to monitor or, or emit, rather, um, infrared, this is a tool to use. The, um, the last one on the list is... Omni Remote, which is a commercial tool, but it, it was featured a while back because people were using it to basically record um, the uh, unlock sequence on car keys. You know, a lot of car keys work in radio frequency, some of them work in IR. So what people would do is they'd just be standing around your car with a Palm Pilot pointing at your key or and surreptitiously record that. And apparently on some models, I'm guessing must have been older models of IR, right? Because typically these codes change every time you use them. Um, you could actually replay it. So you could steal cars with your Palm Pilot. Not a good thing to do. Um, and finally, Palm Czar. Anybody uses this? Good, I made that one up. But it sounds good, doesn't it? <laughs> so so if, if you see it, you heard it here first. Right? And, and you can probably download one MP3 before before your palm fills up. All right, I'm moving rather quickly because there's a lot of stuff to, to go through. Um, DevTools. I'm a big fan of reverse Polish notation, so I like RPN. Uh, it's shareware, but it's cool. Uh, long time is actually a neat little tool. I often find myself looking at logs with Unix time in it, and this is a very you know, nice tool. I can just plug in a Unix time or say, hey, what, what day are we today? What Unix time are we today? And so it'll, it'll calculate stuff for me. Just small stuff, but it comes in handy. Files, oops, I should do this. Files is actually a really cool free program. I can find it here, there we go. And it does a lot of things. So you can, you can basically view all the files that are in your, on your PC, um, on your Palm, I should say. And I don't know, let's, let's, take some, let's take the Austin Network Library. You can look at details. You can modify things like the creator ID, which is the unique ID for the, uh, the library. You can set attributes, take away attributes. You see this copy protect. If this is set, Palm OS is told program not to allow you to beam anything, right? So if you see files like this, you can easily un unprotect them. Um, I Honestly, it's been a long time since I saw anybody still use that because I think I've, a lot of people know that it's really, like I said, it's not quite the... DRM platform of, uh, of the future. The cool thing about it is that it also has an editor, right? So you can view, you can, you've got a hex editor and you can view, you can make modifications to stuff. So now we're starting to get into more of the hacking stuff where if you're looking at, at files and you want to make changes, this is one way to do it. Right there, and you can go in, make whatever changes, see what happens. Um, the next tool that we have, resource edit, is another way. The way Palm applications work is a Palm file is actually called a database. And inside that database, there are multiple 
resources. Some are code, some are text, you know, kind of like a lot of executables. So what Resource Editor does is it allows you to edit resources. So if we take, I don't know, let's take, um, uh, I don't know, let's try Datebook, right? So we open Datebook, you can see all the different resources it has. See, M bar, that's a menu bar. So we can open that. And we can see that it, the menu bar has three different kind of menus, right? You can open that. And you can see what menus there are. And you can change them. So obviously, if you're in, uh, I probably wouldn't change appointment, because you're looking at a ROM application right now. But uh, you can change a lot of things. The cool thing about Resource Edit is that it will allow you to, it will allow you to edit icons, like bitmaps and stuff. And if I can find, oh, here we go. Why don't we look at something? Uh, we have disassembler. It's just kind of cool, right? So you're on your palm. You're like, whoa, I think I know what this program is doing. Or, damn it, I want infinite lives in this game. <laughs> so, so you fire up, you fire up resource edit. You go look at the code, and you think, ah, oh, that's it. It's a branch not equal, right? Usually it's that. You you got to change a branch. You got to basically get rid of a test or jump over a test. So you think you found it. Now here the issue is you have to know how to assemble 68,000 in your head. Well, maybe actually we'll see another tool that might help us there. But if you did know the opcode, you go back to files, you go patch the binary, and then you get to play your game until the batteries run out. So very cool tool. This is shareware. Files is freeware. Um, I think this is like 15 bucks. So very very neat tool. The last kind of and I think the the tour de force of you know dev tools and kind of hackerish stuff on the Palm is Onboard C. Onboard C is like a complete C development environment that runs on the Palm. It's really impressive stuff. It's not completely, you know, ANSI C. There are a few restrictions, but literally you are coding C. So I had it create like a, a hello world, and I called it hello world.c, and it appended a .c to it. So, but we can do, we can go to edit. Oh, no, we don't want to go to resource editor, sorry. We let me go back to onboard C. What I really want to do is just edit the code. There we go. Um, so this is the editor that comes with it. Also freeware, source edit, and you can see this is. Hopefully, if you can read this from the back, can you guys read this all the way from the back? Yeah. Oh, okay, that's good. So here it is. Here's the application, right? All C code. You could compile it on your desktop. You can do it right there on the palm. Um, so if we go back to onboard C, oops, sorry. If we go back to onboard C, and we click on Hello World, and we say build. There we go, building header, compiling. There we go, it built. And we can go to unfiled, see if we have an application. Yes, Hello World.C. There we go. That's the application we just built. So you can literally develop C code on your phone. Um, in my opinion, you've got to have a masochistic streak to do that because <laughs> if you code like I do, which is you make mistakes, then you're going to be crashing your palm all over the place because this is not a very forgiving environment, right? You, you have bus errors and all sorts of stuff. So, but it's still very cool. Yes, question? Oh, well, on the emulator, you're not so much a masochist, but you're really looking for the difficult way to do it. Because what you do on the, instead of using the emulator, we'll actually talk about the tools development environment on the, on the PC. And you develop it on the PC and just upload it to the emulator and then run it there. Uh, it would be less painful to do it on the emulator, but not, not recommended. Uh, but the emulator is awesome. And uh, interestingly, as a side note, the emulator doesn't have an equivalent in um, OS 5. In OS 5, they have what they call as a simulator. And what they've done is they've compiled OS 5 into native x86 code. I believe they've done it for the um, PowerPC as well, so you can run it on Mac OS. And the reason I'm guessing they've done that is it would have been way too much overhead to try and emulate a, uh, uh, a device that is running way faster than the old Palms were, right? Because now you've got an ARM chip that's running at maybe 400 megahertz, and it's expecting to run at that speed. Unless you have a really powerful PC, it's not going to look that good. So anyway, OS 5 has a simulator. But to all intents and purposes, pretty much the same thing. So quick tour of some of the cool um, some of the cool applications, or at least 
the application I think are cool on the palm. I had a question here earlier about can we get these slides? Um, question is yes, but I'm not quite sure how. Uh, DEFCON has a copy, and I'm hoping that they either go on a CD or on the website. If that doesn't happen, I will bundle them, or uh, yeah, pretty much the same, the same ones you see here, with the actual release of the tool. And so in a few days, you'll be able to download them there. They'll be included with the, the distribution of the tool. OK? And uh, right at the end of the press, to make sure that you stay, because I know you want this tool, um, there is the URL for, for the tool. So um, I'm going to go quickly over this interesting hardware, things you might want to have or, or use if you're writing stuff for Palm OS. And cool things that people have done, like putting pilots in robots and things like that. Uh, the keyboard is kind of neat. There have been a lot of these folding keyboards. This keyboard is, I actually have one. It works fairly well. The nice thing about it is that it doesn't use a connector. It uses a little arm that swings up and talks to your infrared port. So it actually works for power PCs, um, pocket PCs, sorry, and palms and other devices as long as you have the driver. So if you buy a keyboard, you don't have to give it up once you decide to change uh, PDAs. All right, I couldn't resist some comic relief about this is an old Dilbert about the uh, the handwriting recognition of the of the palm of the original palms so some of you who have learned graffiti and maybe write graffiti better than they write normal handwriting will appreciate this uh, let's go on okay present all right another trivia question how many palm OS handhelds are in the market today according to palm and I'm guessing what in the market means just sold, right, since the beginning of time. I've got to believe some of them. Are. Sorry. Four million. four million. I have four million here. Do I hear more? <laughs> four million. Going once. Five million. You guys are way too low. Do I hear more? How much? 38. Okay, that's too high. 24 is what they say, which is still pretty cool. So, so 24 million is what they claim, and I'm assuming they're counting... Um, Palm OS devices, not just Palm handhelds, but Sony, Handspring, Handera, Kyocera, all the rest. Um, so now we're going to talk about a Palm vulnerability scanner, right? So the first question you may ask is, why write it? Well, it's a good question. I mean, Palm isn't exactly a really powerful platform. Uh, so the couple answers. One, I thought it'd be fun. Two, it's kind of the reverse Everest answer. You know, it's like, why did you climb Everest? Because it was there. Well, I wrote this because nothing was there, or at least I couldn't. couldn't I didn't, don't know of any other scanners. Um, potentially, it could be, it could be, you know, useful if you're on the road, or in some cases, you'll see what you can do with it. Obviously, if you're going to do any sort of serious security work, you are not going to hand in a report to clients that was purely done on a Palm OS-based vulnerability scanner. Um, but You'll see. It's kind of cool. So what did I originally want to do? I wanted to do TCP UDP scanning. I wanted to support multiple hosts and ports and do banner grabbing and save results in some kind of a reusable format. And if I can read the last text, yes, standalone. It, it needed to be. So one idea was, you know, kind of if you think about the Nessus route, Nessus has a client and a server, right? Well, why not put a, put a server out there somewhere and then write a little client that interfaces to it? Well, I wanted to have something that was just relying on the palm and nothing else. Um, so, and you ask, what about other scanners? Are you sure there are none? Um, not entirely, but other than a mention of a NMAP, an NMAP port for the Palm in 2000, someone was claiming to be working on it. I never saw anything released. So, of course, you know, a little different programs here, but that's about as close as I've seen. Anybody, will anybody gainsay that statement? Huh, okay, so maybe I did do enough research. My goodness, I was happy that no one says, wait a minute, ISS has a, a Palm-based vulnerability scanner. Um, so if you're going to write something, right, you've got to choose development environment. There are tons of development environments for the Palm. Almost any language has been ported to the Palm in some form or fashion. You either develop it on the PC, on your Palm, on all the rest. It's, it's all the, it, there's tons of stuff. So. I decided, well, I'm going to go for, what do I need, right? Technical features. Well, I want to leverage the Palm UI. I want it to be responsive. I kind of want to be able to extend it. 
and I'd like to be able to develop it on the PC. I just don't want a language that forces me to develop on the Palm. Be nice to be able to develop it on the Palm, and most important, I want to reuse other components, which really means I want to be lazy, right? Because if I can interface with something else that's already written, that's less work for me. So you'll find that the the reuse other components or the laziness factor was was influenced a lot of design decisions. So anyway, look at that spinning. Finally, I chose Pocket C. Um, I'll tell you why. So Pocket C is like this interpreted C-like language. C-like is good, right? Because a lot of us program in C, and it's pretty, pretty accessible. Uh, it does all the memory management for strings and stuff for you. It allows you to do multidimensional arrays through a little bit of a hack. You can do structs as well with a minor hack. It's reasonably fast. Developed on the Palm, it actually, it actually has a Palm development environment. Uh, oh, sorry, a PC development environment. And uh, you can obviously do it on the Palm as well. And it's extensible. And you can see the Hello World, right? What's not to love in a language that makes Hello World look like a C program? Uh, any pocket PC programmers here? Can I hear anybody programmed in Pocket PC? Nobody? All right, well, maybe that'll change. Um, you can extend Pocket PC in a couple ways. One is through just what they call the include files. You basically include you know, .h files, but you put code in there. And you can include, you know, create different modules, which is what we did for, for Austin. And you can also create native libraries, which you can interface to, which is also what we did. Must have library for Pocket PC is called Pocket Toolbox. It basically allows you to access all the Palm OS GUI functions. So that is a very, very key feature to be able to do. Has some database functions, graphic functions, a lot of stuff that I'm not using in this program. But a really useful tool. It's free as long as when you release a tool, you kind of let Joe know. You say, hey, Joe, I just released something. And you bundle, you know, you make sure that people know how to get to, uh, to his site. So you might want to, you might be wondering, well, you've been talking about Austin, right? What does Austin stand for? So that's what it stands for. Um, officially. Unofficially, what it really stands for is, well, you know how in the Matrix 2, Trinity is hacking into the computers and stuff, and she's using these cool SSH uh, CRC vulnerabilities. And, well, a friend of mine is talking and saying, well, it's a pity Austin Powers doesn't have anything, right? I mean, Austin Powers doesn't have anything. He doesn't get it to like hack into networks and stuff. So we're joking around about how it would be cool that Austin would say, Dr. Evil, beam me your contact info, baby. And while Dr. Evil was doing that, Austin was really scanning his network. So unofficially, it's all named after Austin Powers. So and I think Austin likes it. <laughs> yes, he likes it. So why don't we have a quick demo of Austin right now? So you can kind of see what it, how it works. And then we'll talk a little bit about the, uh, um, the structure of the program, the architecture. So here is Austin. And I will also, while we're talking, start up a, uh, anybody use VMware? Yeah, yeah, very cool program, isn't it? VMware creates these little virtual computers on your, inside your computer, and I happen to have one, which is a, um, a Windows 2K server, which I use for a bunch of things. So I'm going to start one up, and that's actually what we're going to be scanning. What I'm also going to do with the, uh, the Windows 2K server, because I don't really have very much listening on UDP, and I want to do a UDP scan, I will... Use a netcat listener that's just going to listen on a port, and when it, when someone tries to read it, it's going to just send back some some information. Okay, that way we'll actually we'll actually get something. So, you guys want to see the command for netcat, or you don't care? I'm going to. Oh, okay. I had to let see it. So, here, just so you can kind of see, I'm not quite cheating. Here is our little Windows 2K box, and. Here's my netcat. So we're listening on port 2000, all right? So first thing to do is find the mouse, move this out of the way. All right, so the Austin interface. So you can enter one or more hosts. I'm going to enter the IP address of our host here, 199.129, I believe I typed in correctly. If you want to put multiple hosts, you can, you know, Put www.yahoo. You can, you know, have commas. If you want to use ranges, you can do that too. But we're not going to do that. For ports, you can basically specify them right here. There's another way to specify them. We'll talk about that later. I'm just going to toss in a few. Let's do 135 to 139 since so it's into Windows box. Um, let's do 443, and let's not forget 2000. Oops, 2000. All right. 
So we're going to do UDP and TCP, and let's do a banner grab. All right. So basically, what this will do is it's going to try and connect to these ports with UDP, TCP, and it's going to try and do a banner grab. Now, banner grab, you'll see in the preferences, but you can specify the string it's going to send. Right now, by default, it sends an options HTTP command, which is kind of useful because a lot of things talk HTTP, and you might as well see what, what comes back. The options command basically tells you all the HTTP verbs. If the server supports it, it will tell you all the HTTP verbs that the server um, recognizes. Whoops. And that is the emulator context menu, which we don't really need. So we hit, we start scan, and with a bit of luck, it says it's scanning. Oh, it's found 80 open, 135. That's trying 36, 37, 38. 39 is open as well, 443, and that's it. OK. So great, scan is complete. Here is the one of the first laziness um, principles in action. This little button here, down at the bottom, which looks like a filing cabinet, goes to a program called PilotDB. PilotDB is a free GPL uh, database, which is what Austin writes its, um, its scans in. You'll see there are a couple other databases. We'll talk about those later. But the one thing you have to do is kind of rescan databases. And you can see there's a new database here. Unfortunately, I'm, I, there's a limitation with the pocket toolbox in the size of the, the actual database I can use. So I, I put in a, a timestamp and then as much of the IP address as I can fit. And I need to ask Joe to extend it. So if we click here, you can see, OK, we found a port, open port on 80 for, you know, these are the open ones. So here you can see. All the different things we found. This is what what's, what gets logged, and right here is the banner. Oh, okay, Microsoft IIS 5.0, and all the rest. Okay, so if we scroll down here, we're actually seeing all the different open ports. You see no banner there. There's one byte banner that came back here, and then UDP 2000. We got a hello world back, which is what was in my my file. So that basically gives you the results. The reason. So a couple of reasons why uh, using PilotDB. Well, obviously, one, it's, it's great, right? If I, if, as long as I write the results in PilotDB, I don't have to write an interface for you to access it. Plus, it's a database program, so you can search on things. And you can manipulate the, uh, the columns and things, stuff to show, show different information. The other reason is, uh, once you sync this to your desktop, there are tools to convert these files into CSVs. So once you have a common separated value file, you can do whatever you want with it. So presumably, you can integrate that into other information. So let's go back to, to port 80. Right? We're like, oh, OK, well, that's kind of interesting. We had, we had here uh, Microsoft IIS. So let's go to another feature of Austin. Let's actually do a URL scan. So we're gonna, we'll use the vulnerability database here. The vulnerability database is actually rather a grand term, because it's really a URL scanning database. Uh, I will typically what you do is you'd fire off the whole thing, but just to show you different, we're going to select which test we want to do. So see, there's an IS web server. We'll do this. Here is just a quick test to check whether debug.asp is there. You can see I haven't really used this checkbox. It's kind of there to say, well, if this is a DOS or a check that might DOS the server, you know, at least let people know. Um, method head or get HTTP method to use request to request the, uh, the URL. Match R colon colon basically says look for 200, right? Look for a return code of 200, and then here's what to say if it, if there are issues. So go further down, different vulnerabilities, and here's one on the infamous Unicode one. Here we're doing a get, and we're trying to match these characters inside the uh, inside the the results. So what we'll do now is we've selected these. Why don't we just select port 80? Since we know that's the web server. Let's forget about UDP right now. Let's click on URL scan. All right. So it says it's scanning, complete. And what we want to do is rescan databases. And nothing, right? It found nothing. So that's kind of disappointing. So we go back to Austin. We can enter the interactive mode. Like, why? Well, I, I could have sworn that debug.asp was there. So you can basically type in the URL. I'll type in the IP address, I should say. Let me know if I make a mistake. It's kind of hard to see it from here. And let's, let's actually verify that this, 
uh, but the debug.asp is not there. So HTTP colon slash one one. Oops, double return. All right. So we. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Good. I'm glad that you noticed. So let's connect. Let's send. And oh, we got a whole whole page back. And what do we get? We got a 404. All right. Now I have a suspicion that instead of instead of debug.asp, this might be an infamous, the infamous vulnerability debugging.txt, which you guys may not have heard about, but is really bad. So we'll see if we'll see if we find that on the server. And we do a head, and yes, we get a 200. This server, by the way, is one of the um, the training servers that we use. Got an application. I won't show it to you now, but it's got an application called At Stake Bovine Products, and it also has a file called debugging.txt on it to uh, explain to you SQL injection. So since we know this, like okay, let's disconnect. Let's go back to the database. We can do a quick modification here. Debug.asp can become debugging.txt, and instead of doing head, we're going to do a get. And we're going to look for a colleague of mine, who I hope is not in the audience, otherwise he'll be upset with me, look for his name. So if we find a document written by Mr. Hawthorne, we're in trouble, right? So we want to match on Hawthorne. And um, that's it. I'll leave that. Go back to Austin. You see that Austin remembers the settings you gave it, so uh, we'll run this again. It's banner grabbing. OK. And we rescan databases. You always have to do that, because Oh, there we go. We have a web vulnerability. Cool. So that kind of gives you a feel for Austin. Um, what you can do now is you can kind of, if you want to, if you want to see what the page looks like, you can grab the URL, copy it, and go to, let's say, our favorite program, Eudora Web. I haven't run this before, so we're going to agree to the license. Say visit. And I will paste it in and say OK. And there we go. And that actually, Eudora went and downloaded the information. You can see it's from Mr. Hawthorne, and it's a SQL injection demonstration. So that's it. That is, in a nutshell, most of Austin. And now let's get back to the press. Uh, all right. Yes, all right. So very briefly, Austin architecture. You can kind of see how it's written. Obviously, Palm hardware, Palm OS. And then we've got Pocket C, which is a runtime with two native libraries. I'm not going to spend much time on the blue stuff. That's written in Pocket C. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on the network library. Because even if you don't care about Austin, if you do want to develop stuff with Pocket C or network stuff, you can actually use the net library um, on your own and do a bunch of stuff with it. So tools to develop Austin, we talked about the emulator, Pocket C de desktop environment. PRC tools is what includes all the GCC tools. Thank you. PRC tools has GCC and a bunch of other tools to create Palm executables, all free, Palm SDK. And then the pilot resource compiler is used to compile those little resource files that describe GUIs. So, the Palm OS network library is actually pretty cool. It's actually fairly comprehensive. It supports TCP, UDP. You can have raw sockets available as well. Some of the lessons learned, close the sockets as soon as possible. The sockets, you know, you get about six to play with. If you use up six sockets and you're not closing them, everything stops until, until some of those sockets get closed. So make sure you close them all the time. Um, and you do have a Berkeley interface into these, uh, into the network library calls, so you can do socket and open and bind and all these things. But using the actual Palm OS calls gives you a lot more flexibility. Um, I'm going to skip over the native library. You can kind of see this is an example of actual native C code. Um, this is a quick example of what it would take to do to program ahead. So just go to a go to a web server, ask for an IP address and port. Go to the web server, connect. Actually, I, there's a mistake there. See, I'm connecting on port 80, but I'm, I'm, I should be connecting on the port that was specified. Write something, read something, and close the socket. So really simple code right now to, to write TCP code in, 
or network-based code in Pocket C once you have the wonderful Austin Net Library. Um, a lot of lessons learned about net libraries. It was about native libraries for, for the Pocket T. It was painful because there isn't much documentation. If you're going to be doing it, I suggest you download. By the way, Austin is GPL. So feel free to download it, look at the code, use it, make changes to it, and then you know tell everybody about the wonderful improvements you've made. So you can definitely reuse the Austin net library. And make sure you look at the make file and stuff like that, because it took me a while to get everything working correctly. And there, isn't, there really isn't much documentation especially around passing some of the more complex structures between Pocket C and C. Database access, we talked about that a little bit. Um, we actually support two database formats, uh, but PilotDB is what, what I'd recommend. The, um, there are three t types of databases we use, preferences, web volumes, and results. You've seen the web volumes, you've seen the results. Um, really, the, the other preferences, the preferences of the other provinces of Austin, I should say, are uh, basically places where you can say, OK, well, this is the banner I want to use. And if you don't want to specify TCP ports, you can actually specify them here. If you leave the ports field blank, you can actually select different, different ports to check here. So if you're doing the same kind of scans all over the place, you can just create one entry here, put in the ports you want, and then make sure it's selected, and that will get used. You can have banners. You know, and different banner entries and stuff like that. And then there are different um, there are different uh, um, basically preferences you can set. And each preference has a description. So if you're playing around with Austin, you can go in there and just see what it does and mess around, see what 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 changes. Um, it's very nice. I mean, you really get a lot of benefit from using this stuff because hey, the whole database manager is there, and I didn't have to do very much for it. Graphical user interfaces could be a complete talk in and of itself. So we're not going to go there. Um, you can see, basically, I put in a little bit of how you would define one. You can see the, the different uh, tags that you use, like, hey, I want a button, and here's where I want it, and here's the ID. And in your code, in your event code, you basically wait for an event to happen. And when it does, you look at the ID, and you can say, oh, someone clicked on scan. So that's basically how it, how it happens. Schedule scanning, there are two buttons that I didn't really show in Austin. Uh, schedule scan and NASL scan. NASL scan is future, it doesn't work, or it's non enabled. Um, the, it's a nice, nice silhouette. Schedule scanning, basically, Pocket C will tell the pump to go to sleep and wake up at whatever intervals you set and then run the scan. So if you want to scan like for a week on end, it's kind of a fun feature that was cheap to add, so I added it. If you want to scan once a day for a week, you can just, you know, Leave your leave your pilot plugged in, and it'll every day it'll wake up and run a scan, and and then go back to sleep again. So tying it all together, basically, if you want to create an application, this is typically what you do. You have source code and icons, and a creator ID. You have to register one from Palm. Otherwise, you know you can have conflicts, and if people have multiple creator IDs, the Palm OS gets confused. So you get one from Palm, you run it through the Palm desktop, the Pocket C desktop environment that creates and executable. You take the resource compiler, the resource definitions, you run it through the resource compiler, that creates a file. You can combine that with a program called PAR into a file called Austin. You could also bundle in the network library. I left everything split apart in the, uh, in the distribution so people can mess with different files as, you know, more easily. But that's how you basically integrate everything. So very different, um, very different tack now. I'm going to talk to you about tools that a friend of mine has written. Who has a Sony Ericsson P800? Two people. All right. Well, no, three people. Excellent. So some of you have it. Um, colleague of ours called Ollie Whitehouse, which is a very skilled uh, security guy, uh, knows a ton of stuff, and a very good developer. He's written a bunch of different tools. So that's a little bit about the P800. Basically, it's a you know, cell phone, GSM-based. Ollie lives in London, so he's all GSM. and. Uh, runs the Symbian OS, right? So different tools he developed. One is NetScan, TCP UDP port scanner, kind of like uh, kind of combination of, uh, or uh, Austin is kind of a combination of that and Mobile Pen Tester. So Mobile Pen Tester is a little bit like Austin, although it's a little bit more powerful in some features. Can do NetScan, can do some PDA Cat, which is like a NetCat, and there you can see Ollie's Ollie's hand playing with his phone. 
Um, there's also he also wrote a tool called PDA Zap, which is a um, tool that will basically down your, or download all your memory, so you can use it for a incident response or forensics. All right, you can get them at the AtStake website, and you can see Ollie. See, if ever you meet Ollie, you can say hi, Ollie. I saw you at DEF CON, and uh, if you want to see Ollie in person, he is speaking at the Chaos Communication Camp um, in August. Anybody going to the Chaos Communication Camp? No. Well, that's a disappointment. All right, I have a trivia question for you. Who can tell me what that is? And the person who guesses what that is first gets a Compaq Speedpack cellular PC card free. No, 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 no. At stake. <laughs> At stake employees <laughs> not <laughs> may not may not reply. Uh, sorry, say say it again. Ericsson hotline. That's kind of annoying because I don't know if my what I know I've been told what this is because I had no idea, but I don't know what the make and model is. So what is Ericsson hotline? What is it? It was a mobile phone. Ancient. All right. I think the gentleman. I think the gentleman has it. All right. It is a very ancient mobile phone. It's all these kind of joke. But all right. So very good. All right. Who knows what caption goes with this? Congratulations, sir. Come on. Someone remember this. This is Paul Man's Palm. Close. Close. Redneck PDA. Yes. Yeah. So that's the redneck PDA. This, by the way, will not be in the official presentation if ever I put it in the... <laughs> All right, let's briefly talk about the future. Um, by the way, if anybody works for Palm here, I would love to get in on the beta trials for the new Treo 600. Thank you. Um, so the idea here, NASL scanning. You saw the, the checkbox. You know, why do it? NASL, for those of you who don't know, is the Nessus attack simulation language. It's what's used to write about 95% of the NASL uh, scripts. Um, basically, if you look at Nestle and Pocket C, there's a lot of similarity. It's another interpreted C-like languages. And one thing I'm looking at is to see whether it would be possible to write a translator that would translate the Nestle into Pocket C. And yep, we've got, we're, we're done. Nestle into Pocket C and, uh, and then run it on, on Austin. So that would be kind of cool. Other ideas for features, I think we could create custom ID, IP packets. And given the fact that we can do raw IP, and there are a bunch of other things that other support. If you guys have suggestions, you can email them to me. So, thumbs up, thumbs down. Do we achieve the goals? Yes? Yeah, okay. You don't count, Fred. Fred's a colleague of mine. He's being difficult. All right. Well, thanks for listening. The URL is down there. You can just grab it from the tool section. And uh, if you have any questions, since we're out of time, just come find me. I'm may not hang out of the pool, but I'm here the rest of the uh, DEF CON. Thanks a lot. Thanks.